Jó estét kívánok ez az esti közelkép a Debrecen Televízió közéleti műsora. Ma rendkívüli adással jelentkezünk. John Malkovics a Kölcsei Központban lép fel adásunkkal egy időben. A Zenekritikus című műsorát Magyarországon kizárólag Debrecenben láthatja a közönség. Az új pápa, a Koner, a Fegyenc járat és a Red sztárja hétfőn exkluzív interjút adott stábunknak a Debreceni Egyetemen. Ezt vetítjük le most önöknek. I'm very delighted to have a great actor, director and producer, John Malkovich, sitting in front of me. Good evening and welcome to Debrecen. Good evening. Thank you, Thank you very much uh, for devoting time for to this interview. So let's start with a warm-up question. You have just arrived at Debrecen. Uh -huh. Did you have the chance to look around and if so, what's your first impression about our, our lovely no, city? No, I really didn't get much of a chance, just the drive-in and then we went to lunch in the park, which was lovely but I think we're going to walk a bit the campus after so I'll get to look then. You were shown around the University of Debrecen and you were uh, discussing with the leaders. What kind of topics you discussed about? You haven't even le left but uh, I would like to ask if you are planning to come back to us. <laughs> um, well mostly they were just telling me about the history of the university and a little bit about what programs they were doing now and uh, then we we talked a little bit with the rector the, about the founding of the university when it was built etc and then uh, we were talking about the the Habsburg empire and the, the just the the history of this region obviously we hungarian people know you from the movies from the mm -hmm. screen mm -hmm. but finally thank god we can see you on stage you will play in the music critic Mm -hmm. uh, so the question has arisen, uh, to, to what extent you, Mr. Malkovich, are a music critic? Does the evil character, the evil critic you play, evoke the critic in you? I mean, this way or that way, everyone is a critic, right? Um, yes, sure. I mean, I'm a critic to the extent I just discern between what I like and don't really care for what interests me and doesn't really interest me much. Um, sometimes I can be surprised, not not so often, but sometimes. Um, I don't know that I would say the critic is evil. You know, this is really, I think there are probably 40 critics cited in our piece. It's not about an individual critic per se. It, it's about the notion of criticism and how to uh, maybe how how to deal with criticism because the basic premise of the music critic is that uh, I read often quite terrible reviews of some of the greatest classical music in, in the whole history of the, the canon of Western classical music. Many of these wonderful, e even very historical pieces were destroyed when they, they were first heard. And of course that's a, that can be the fate of many uh, great notions, be they creative, technological, uh, medical, who knows. It, it's a very interesting piece to me because I think it shows that uh, many great talents in the world had to overcome great obstacles and impediments and often quite ferocious criticism. Your passion for classical music is known, and you you used to play the guitar, right? Am mm -hmm. I right? Mm -hmm. Still, it's uh, very provocative and full of uh, sarcasm. This piece. Why did you say yes when you were asked to play in this piece? Well, I work a lot in classical music. I've done three long, long collaborations, two of which I have done in Hungary. I, I did uh, both in Budapest. The first one out. Uh, at the Comedy Theatre in Budapest and, and the other in the hall, I forgot the name of the, the music hall. 
uh, called Just Call Me God a few years ago. So I have performed in Budapest. I love the concept of the music critic. It's not about playing a particular role because it's, it's not really a role. It's a, a it's, it, they're reviews, but uh, it's because of what it says, I think, um, and, and because the music is so great, I think. And if nothing else, uh, I think people can leave there, leave the, that piece understanding more about criticism in general, about understanding more about classical music, and hopefully having an appreciation, uh, an elevated appreciation as compared to to not having seen the piece, uh, an elevated appreciation of, of some of the great pieces and the great beauty of, of some of the great classical music pieces. Do you have a Turkish visa? <laughs> I do have a Turkish you visa, You do have? Yes. So the story is you were sent a review in which you were criticized. Mm -hmm. And then you said it was a fantastic piece of mm -hmm. paper, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, that is how the finale was born. What is this about the Malkovich torment? Is this about uh, self-criticism or it's about uh, fighting back your critics? No, I don't think it's about fighting back. There's nothing to fight about. I don't... Uh, Imagine I look at Jackson Pollock or I look at uh, Rembrandt. I'm not going to be interested in Jackson Pollock. It's it's not my thing. It's not, it's not my taste. It doesn't appeal to me. Uh, and no amount... I don't need to say he's terrible. That's okay. I'm not an expert. I just respond as a person. I think that's mostly what critics do. Uh, a critic hated a piece I did in Istanbul a few years ago, a classical music piece. Uh, I absolutely disagree with his assessment, totally, and I think most of the world disagreed completely, including in Turkey. But uh, this is a piece w that was invited around the world for five years, from Finland to Berkeley to Santiago de Chile to everywhere in between. Um, but I loved the review because it was so had such depth of feeling, and I thought it was hilarious too. And so what? You're criticized. So what? You, you of course you don't like to disappoint people, but you, people their reaction is their own. I mean, I don't react for them. Looking at you on screen, it's like, wow, it's really impressive. Looking at you on stage, I'm really waiting for. Please tell me how it feels like to act in the theatres. Does it make any difference to play a surrounded being only by the staff and the cameras? Or uh, acting in front of the audience while you can keep, in, keep eye contact with the audience? Well, it depends on the piece, you know. Really depends on the piece. Um, there are some pieces you don't really have a lot of contact with the audience. There are some pieces where you may have a lot of contact with the audience. That really depends. Um, this piece, there is a lot of contact with the words uh, and a lot of contact with the music. But some pieces, uh, for instance, the, the Infernal Comedy was uh, a monologue was essentially a fake book reading to a public. Um, and uh, so that was almost only contact with the audience. It depends on the piece. Let's take a step from the theater to the movie, The New Pope. Let's talk about The New Pope. Mm -hmm. It really became an internet sensation long before its premiere, right? There is something about it. It's very provocative, sacred mm -hmm. and profane at the same mm -hmm. time. and. Mm -hmm very mysterious. Again, the question, why did you say yes when you were asked to play in it? 
Well, I have great respect for the work, of the body of work of Paolo Sorrentino, the great Italian director who who's directs it, wrote it. So when Paolo asked me to do it, of course we didn't have scripts, and he, he then wrote them, and I read them, and we discussed that. And it is true that I'm not religious, and I, I, I don't have a peculiar, particular, not peculiar, I don't have a particular interest in, in the kind of inner workings of the Vatican. But having said that, I loved the first series. I thought it was terrific. And when I was asked to, to participate, I was delighted to. Um, I understood that, that certain representatives of the church or people writing for, um, maybe not for the church, but supposedly representing the opinions of the church were supposedly very upset by it. I think that's kind of unfair, but mm -hmm. I understand the the young pope would have agreed with them. I think it is profane, but I, I think it's also quite sacred in part. Um, I'll put it this way, I sincerely doubt that watching the new pope would make any Catholics run away from the church. I think on the contrary, actually. But uh, that's why I did it. Uh, because I, I think Paolo is a fantastic uh, filmmaker and because I like the first season enormously, I think it's so uh, excellent. I absolutely agree. I think your character is much more than an English aristocrat. It's much deeper. Mm -hmm. Did you approach this character psychologically, theologically, when you created this character in your mind? Well. Uh, Paolo and I talked at length uh, about it. It obviously needed to. It had to be a character with a history. How did he get there? What is his capacity to do this appointment? And of course you want to know what is his philosophical point of view, how does he feel about the church, what is his notion of faith, um, what, it, what are his theological underpinnings really, and those are the things that Paolo and I discussed. And then of course just discussing how is that made most clear or most elegant in English, and in, in this case, English English, because English English and American English sometimes don't have a great deal in common, and, and I'm not English. You play in the upcoming Netflix series Space Force, and we are craving for secrets. I know there are things that are uh, confidential, but um, the announcement uh, came shortly after President Donald Trump directed the Pentagon to create the Space Force. Mm -hmm. What's the idea behind the series and uh, what can we know so far? Uh, well, probably first I would start with two of the people involved. And, uh, that would be Greg Daniels, who was the American sort of creative force between the American version, Ricky Gervais, who showed The Office, and, and Greg did the American version. Very funny, it was Stephen Carell who in his own right is a, a very funny uh, writer and a very funny actor and, and an excellent actor apart from being funny as well. Greg Daniels also did the show Parks and Recreation, an extremely funny American comedy that a Amy Poehler was the headliner but had a whole cast of super entertaining amusing characters and really well written and essentially this is a 30 minute comedy uh, per episode for Netflix. Stephen Carell plays the head of the Space Force who's kind of a knucklehead and um, I play sort of his antagonist really at least initially who is the 
head of science at Space Force. Um, so the, the, the sort of, I guess, astrophysicist who doesn't have a lot in common with Stephen <laughs> Carell's character. And uh, it has an excellent cast of, of uh, actors, male and female, most of whom are either stand-up comics, uh, writers, comedy actors, former Second City or Saturday Night Live actors, uh, some extremely funny people, uh, young and old and everything in between. Listening to you, I must say that I really love your voice. To oh, me, you. to me, it's calm, but at the same time, a little bit threatening. And I think that's what's, what makes you a great actor. <laughs> How come you do not like the sound of your voice? In an interview, you said you do not like your voice. I don't, I don't think most people like the sound of their voice, really. I think it's perfectly normal. Um, I remember when they first started with uh, answering machines, and people would hear their voice and just scream. Uh, oh, how, how terrible <laughs> I sound like that. I don't do that. It's just, I don't never really cared for the sound of my voice, really. You are arf often referred um, as an innovator, and you're also a fashion designer. Why does an actor need to express himself through fashion? I mean, you can be anyone who you want. Mm -hmm. You can personalize anyone. Mm -hmm. Why is this uh, passion for Well, fashion? I'm not doing it anymore. I, I stopped a couple of years ago. but. Um, I didn't care some I didn't care about fashion which only interests me depending on the object so there are some there are certainly some things uh, about the fashion business that I couldn't possibly be less interested in or couldn't possibly care less about but the actual objects among those, there are many I like, and then among those actual objects, how did they become objects, and what, what was the thinking behind them, and why are they like this? I guess I always had an interest in all of, or most all of the applied arts. I mean, my favorite museum in the world is the Mach in Vienna, and I love to go and see what their expositions are. But I could be as interested in book bindings from the Vienna Werkschaft uh, as I could be in anything in my field. Um, I just always had that interest. Um, and fashion is like, is like any creative field, I think. It's just another form of self-expression. Uh, I like drawing, I like designing, I've done, designed many other things outside of fashion, but, but, and, and I'm a long time fabric collector, so that's part of it as well, um, but for me it just was another form of self-expression. Once you said, you seek nothing to show people, <laughs> you want to do things that interest you. Mm -hmm. So what does really interest you? What keeps you going now? That. Um, just that. Uh, I, I think people are lucky, um, maybe by nature and maybe it's by, I don't know, in some ways probably I credit some of the people I worked with who at the time were, were much older than me. I don't know, people like Marcello Mastroianni, Dustin Hoffman, many others probably, who retained such a passion and interest in what they were doing. Uh, or say in the case of Marcello, such a delight in, in it that uh, I think that probably had an influence on me. Of course, I've always been a curious person. Of course, I've always had my interests. So 
and that interest and those curiosities are over quite a broad field. They just always have been. Learning things is its own reward. Not, not so that you can show someone what you know. That's not very interesting, I think. Um, or what you can do. Does it matter? Uh, I don't think so. Um, but so that you can learn and when you learn and one of the things I hope I hope we learn or I think I'm sure they probably learn it at Deberson I, I think hopefully people learn it in the world is is uh, how complicated the world is and uh, how to appreciate things of beauty even if they're very ephemeral uh, as long as you have the the capacity to do that, uh, and to to be interested, to be curious about the world, then I think that is enough to keep anybody going. You know, if you lose that interest, okay, then I don't know what will happen. Where do you see yourself in twenty years? Please tell me that on stage. God knows. Um, I don't know. Uh, sometimes stage is hard. I just finished a long run of a play this summer. On the other hand, it was much, much easier than I expected. So, to be honest, I don't know how old you can be and really be effective and, and let's say sort of comfortable on stage or, or enjoy the experience. Because I think at a certain point in time your memory, uh, this piece is, is scripted. play I did this summer was almost uh, nearly a hundred pages of blah blah blah, that's a lot of blah blah blah. And I think you reach, our memories start to fail us I think actually in our forties. So uh, I'm in my mid-60s. That will just depend. I, I don't have any particular problem, uh, and I know much younger people who do, but, but still you have to be realistic about what you can do or not do on stage. So, I don't know, we'll see. John, thank you very much for my the conversation, pleasure. and thank, thank you for devoting time to us. Cheers, thank you. <laughs>